Um, the 8 o'clock was great this morning. We, we had like 200 and, I don't know, like 70 people come. So it was uh, more than we had expected, which was really great. And uh, we had some early risers, which are people after my own heart. And they're clearly the most spiritual anyway. But like they're... Um, no, but like it was great having uh, that one, and obviously we have our 11 o'clock as well, and that'll be the same schedule from here on out. And then uh, I, I, I forgot to announce this in the first service, so I'm just going to do it now. Uh, we, our Good Friday service will be in here at 7.30, okay? So we have, we have one Good Friday service, 7.30, and, uh, and then we'll have our normal Easter on a Sunday. Uh, if you are new here with us, my name is John Wagler, and I'm a part of the team here, and so thankful that uh, you chose to be here on this Sunday morning. Uh, we are in the last, as Venus said, we are in the last week of our uh, You Have Heard series, which has been 14 weeks long, and that's uh, been the longest series that we've done uh, here at Hill City. Uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed prepping it, and it's been incredibly challenging. The, the idea when we first started was, hey, I just wanted to like, take some time for us to actually go through and, and hear what Jesus taught you know, and to actually take it in. And so we've been going through stage by stage of this uh, collection of his teachings in Matthew chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7. And uh, what we started learning uh, right from the get-go was that uh, if you're new to this whole faith, if you're skeptical about it or whatever it is, like what this series has done and what the Sermon on the Mount does is it gives us a great perspective on what it means to follow Jesus. And so that, that's like one great thing. The, the other thing is if you're new and seasoned in all of this, it becomes this consistent challenge of, are we actually following Jesus? Are we actually doing what we say uh, that we believe? And, uh, and we've been using this line uh, for the whole entire series, which is that Jesus invites us uh, to follow, not to just lich- listen, which implies to follow means you trust, uh, to follow means you're active uh, in your faith. And so uh, we've been going around this, and, and this week I, I wrote this down, that, that Jesus sets a distinctive value system that can't be replicated unless you follow him. So, so this is what, like, at the core of everything we've been doing, it's like Jesus sets this stuff forward uh, for purpose and for identity and for our hope and for freedom, but you can't just kind of do it to experience it. The peace that we just sang about, the peace that Jesus talks about, you can't just like kind of do it and, and expect to experience it. We've got to truly follow him. And in order to actually experience it, you've got to be willing to go all in and give Jesus everything that we have. And so he kind of ends all of this uh, in Matthew chapter 7. We're going to be in verses 24 through 29. And this passage is one that if you grew up in church, like you, you're pretty familiar with it. Uh, if you didn't grow up in church with the Bible, it's okay. We'll, like, we'll catch you right up on it. But it's a pretty simple teaching. And it's about something that he's been really woven in throughout each of his teachings uh, throughout this series. And so if you have your Bibles, open it up to Matthew chapter 7. It'll be up on the screen as well. It says this in verse 24. It says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash." When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Uh, Growing up in uh, Sunday school, uh, we used to sing this song uh, that was off of this passage. And some of you guys might remember that, right? The uh, you would say, uh, the wise man built his house upon the sand, the rains came tumbling down, the rains came down, the floods came. How many guys remember? That? Anyone? Remember? Okay. So the rains came down, floods came out, and then the house on the sand went splat. Right? Yeah. Good Sunday school like memories, right? <laughs> but then we would get to this part where we kind of do the opposite. It would be like, and the wise man built his house upon the rock, right? And kind of go through the whole thing. And now when, when I, church, my church, when we grew up, we would go, and the house on the rock stood firm. And then we all went, ah, like that was our, that's like I have this like vivid memory of doing that. I don't even know how old I was, but, but we always did that. And it was like so exciting to do it, right? Like I want you guys to do it, right? With me. We're going we're gonna to sing it. We're going to be like, and the house on, on the rock stood firm and scream with me. All right, you ready? And the house on the rock stood firm. Ah, see, it feels good, right? And you feels good like to hear other people do it. And, and so it was this idea 
this idea that everything in your life is based off your foundation. Everything is based off your foundation. And that's been the whole kind of crux of the teachings of Jesus. He's like, hey, you're building your life on something, but what is it built on? Like, that's the main question even for today is, is what's your life built on? And it's something that we've got to engage. It's something that we've got to think about. It's something that we've got to wrestle with because here's the thing. We, you might have a little crack in your foundation. If you've, ever, uh, uh, if you've ever bought a house before, you know this process. An inspector comes and he looks at your house and the, the last thing you want to hear is him say something, hey, there's a crack in your foundation. Now, why is that? Well, because that means you, like, your house might have to get jacked up and you might have to uh, replace the foundation, which is incredibly expensive. Uh, it means that your house isn't as solid as you think that it is. And it might look good on the outside, but really it could tumble at any moment. And so what Jesus is saying is this. We've got to take a look at our foundation. We've got to see, what is my life really built on? Is, is it really built on the things of Jesus or is it built on something else? Is, is it built on uh, something that really isn't true? Is it built on something that if everyone else in this world built their life on exactly what you build on, you would sit there and be like, well, that wouldn't be the smartest idea. You ever thought about that? Like if, if everyone handled money and built their thought process and built their whole life in the same way that you handle money, would you be like, man, things would be so great. If everyone thought of love and, and marriage and dating and friendships and sexuality and whatever it is, if everyone thought exactly how it is that you think and you built your life and your foundation on, would you be like, this is, yes, it would be so exciting. This world would be so great. Or would you think, man, we'd be in trouble. And so what that tells you immediately is that you're not building your life on something that's truly true, that's strong, that can that can withstand the test of time. You see, here's what we do know, that in life, stuff's going to happen. In life, things are going to get thrown at you. In life, you're going to have emotional storms. You're going to have intellectual storms. You're going to have physical storms. You're going to have things in your life that you can't control storms. And here's the thing that you got to th figure out. Are you going to go like this? Or are you going to go, ah, in the midst of it? It's something that we've got to truly think about. Is there a crack in my foundation? Is there something that isn't truly right? Am I really following Jesus in the midst of this? You know, in verse 24 and 26, he, he does this comparison of wise versus foolish, of right versus wrong. I mean, think about it this way. How many of you guys have made decisions in your life where uh, at the time you thought was wise, but really you look back and it was incredibly stupid? And dumb. See, in those moments, what? You were making your decisions off of a foundation that really wasn't wise, that really wasn't about Jesus, that was really only about you. And the end result, because we can all raise our hands in those moments, the end result is what? You move further away from God. You miss God and everything that you, like, around you. And, and, and you start leading down a path that becomes foolish. And what Jesus is teaching us here is he says, listen, those things are going to come. Those, those moments of wondering, those moments of, when I said intellectual storms, that could be like doubts you might have about all this stuff. Um, um, it might be emotional storms where, where something in your life doesn't go the exact way you, you want it to. Uh, it might be a physical storm where, where something happens and, and you have some sort of ailment that you didn't plan on. Or maybe it's something that's completely out of your control. Someone dies, someone gets sick, some, whatever it is. When those things come your way, are you going to be standing strong or are you going to sink in the sand? And it's all about foundation. And so Jesus is asking us to answer, what is your life really built on? Truly. As you begin to look through every area of your life, what is it really built on? This is why I like the tangible aspects of when we teach through Jesus' teachings because what he always does is like he wants to make it tangible, doesn't he? It's like when we talked about generosity, I love the tangible aspect of it. It's like, are you generous? There's a tangible aspect and a tangible way to find out. You can look at your bank account. You can look at your tax return to figure out if you have truly said, you know what, Jesus, you've got control of my money. There's a tangible way of the words that come out of our mouth. If I sat with you and said, hey, uh, um, think about your words this week. 
Like, have they been encouraging and gracious and kind and forgiving? Right? Have, have you, have you kind of submitted your words to Jesus? Are you, have you built your words, your foundation on, on, on Jesus? We can go through every single area, and, and we have to continue to ask ourselves, what am I really building my life on? And is it true in every area of my life? Because if it isn't, we won't see the perspective that God has for us. If it isn't, we'll be build our lives on something else. And here's the thing about what we build our life on. Uh, what we build our life on uh, determines, determines uh, how we want to shape the world. It determines every perspective we have. It determines every choice that we make. It determines how we see every scenario that we're in. It is solely based on our foundation. Well, I was thinking about this. I said, all right, well, what are some indicators for us then that would say, all right, hey, uh, my life or uh, my, my foundation is built on Jesus. And I, and I just wrote down three big ones. Uh, there are other things that you could go off of this, but here are three big ones. The first one is this. You have a strong community. You have a strong community. Uh, and here's what I mean by strong community. Yes, you are surrounded by people who are building you up and encouraging and empowering you and, and are trying to help each other with the right foundation, the right strength for the right reasons. That's one piece of it. Another piece of it is this, though, that you will do what's necessary to establish a strong community. You will do the right things to have a strong community. You will be the first person to say, stop gossiping. You will do the one another's passionately. Like, you'll love one another. You'll encourage one another. You'll forgive one another. You'll be kind to one another. You'll be patient with one another. You'll, you'll do all those things. You'll be the first person. That's a strong indicator that the foundation of your life is built on Jesus. You'll be the first person uh, to say something like this. When someone starts chirping about something else or is being divisive in their talk, you'll be the first person that says this. Hey, have you talked to them about that yet? You'd be shocked. Maybe you wouldn't be. But sometimes people will come up to me and they'll be like, Wags, have you heard of blah, blah, blah? And I'll be like, have you talked to them about that yet? What do you think they do at that point? Because they know they haven't. You can just see like the blood rush out of their faces because they realize how wrong they are in that moment. That's not why I say it. It's just, can you imagine a community full of people who when someone started like, talking behind someone's back or someone started gossiping or someone started being divisive in their talk that they went up and they said hey have you talked to them about that yet can you imagine that, that that's what we did well if we want a foundation a community that says hey we're going to be strong we're going to be our foundation will be built on jesus and that's what we do we don't just run when something doesn't go our way we don't just run when we're filled with doubt we don't just run when we get mad about something we we go to people and we say hey you said this, or you did this, and, and what's your perspective on this? I just, because I, like, I'm having a hard time with it. So it's a, it's a good indicator. A uh, second one is this, that you're the common good for all people. So uh, we see this frequently throughout Scripture, and traditionally, uh, in Christian culture, we are pretty good to other Christians, not great, but pretty good to other Christians. There's been like denominational fights forever. And, uh, and there's a competitive nature between churches sometimes. But, so we've been pretty good uh, of how we treat other Christians. But I would say we haven't been pretty good towards people who aren't Christians. I mean, think about this. That the people who didn't know Jesus loved to be around Jesus. Like when we read, when we read the Bible, we see that the people that didn't know Jesus, didn't follow him, didn't uh, have any religious bones in their body or whatever, they were begging to get near Jesus. They wanted to be around him. They wanted to hear what he had to say. They wanted to see how he loved people around them. Now, is that the prevailing thought for churches and Christians right now? I would say no. I, I mean, do you, do you hear people all the time being like, ooh, I can't wait to be around the Christians again. Shouldn't it be that everyone, because of this message of Jesus that we have that's supposed to be so woven into the context of every perspective and every thought and every word that we say, shouldn't it be that every business would want to be like, I need to hire a Christian? Because they have the best ethic, they, have the, they work so hard, they treat people so well, they're so filled with integrity. Man, do they really buy into the vision and everything? They're, they're on this together. Shouldn't it be that, that even if you're kind of waffling on who you should date, like, I need to go find a Christian because, man, they're so solid in how they love people and treat people and so gracious and kind. I'd, I'd love to marry a Christian. 
Shouldn't it be that way? The common good of all people. And then the third one is this, that if, if Jesus is our foundation, it shapes our public and private perspective. So what we say publicly should be the same thing of what we're internalizing. What we say publicly should be the same thing that you would say when you're with your boys or your girls or your best couple friends or your, your close-knit family. It, it should be the same. It shouldn't be in public with some things and we say, we say things one way. Someone, like, say, brings up a political topic and we, we say things one way, but internally we know we, we are saying something else. And so when Jesus is the foundation, there's this continuity in, or this unity between our, our public and our private persona and our thinking that shows that it's our true foundation. So Jesus teaches all of this, and, and then he goes into something that, y'all, like, whenever I've read this passage before, I kind of, like, gloss over this part. But in verse 28 and 29, it says this, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were what? amazed. I feel like you should have had a little more energy with that, by the way. <laughs> the crowds were what? Amazed. Yeah, so when they're sitting there hearing him teach, they're sitting back, they're like, ah, I've never heard this before. I can't believe, what, whoa, this is what it means? And wait, this is what I have to do in my life? This is crazy. This is amazing. I think it should be to the point of when we read the teachings of Jesus or listen to the teachings of Jesus or whatever it is, we should be so amazed because the thought should be that, man, if everyone just followed Jesus, this world would be unbelievable. Our communities would be unbelievable. Our marriages would be unbelievable. Our parenting would be unbelievable. Our friendships would be unbelievable. Our jobs would be unbelievable. Because we sit back in amazement of the fact of, well, if this seeps into me, gosh... I've never lived like this before. I've never thought like this before. I've never remotely could have considered thinking this way. And then it says this, and this is the part that gets me. It says, because he taught with one who had what? Authority. Not as the teachers of the law, and they were the Pharisees at that time. And so this idea of authority is pretty interesting, because when we think about the word authority, it can have this wide spectrum of meaning for us, depending on your experience with authority. So authority, uh, you, you could view in a very healthy way. Um, you could view authority as like an expertise in something or whatever. Um, so authority could be like super healthy. But authority could also be incredibly negative. And when, typically when we talk about authority now, we, we kind of view it as power and control. And when authority is down that kind of road of things, that's where all the injustices happen, right? When people abuse power, people abuse authority, it makes people that are vulnerable, that's where every injustice happens. And so every, every time, like, racism happens, what is that? It's an abuse of authority, abuse of privilege. Uh, it's, it's trying to make uh, those who might be vulnerable, like, that, that's, that, that's how injustice happens. Any ism that we have in our lives, sexism, racism, whatever other ism that's there, is a result of people in authority and using that for power and control and hurting those that were vulnerable. And so that's kind of what we think about authority. So, but Jesus is saying... No, 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 no. Like, you guys got to hear this. And, and as he starts teaching, the people there were like, whoa, there's such authority here. There, there is such power here, but it's a different kind of power. It's, it's something else that reshapes how I view my whole entire life. And, and it's this kind of authority that we're supposed to submit our lives to. In Matthew 28, uh, verse 19, which is known as the Great Commission, Jesus kind of given his final direction to people. And he says this uh, in verse 18. He says, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. All authority on heaven and on earth. So when he says all authority, here's what this means. That to follow Jesus means that we are willing to put ourselves underneath his authority. His direction. And that when we look at uh, what has the final word in our life, it, it's it, in the final authority in our life, it's, it's whatever Jesus taught. So, so in our lives, if you're a follower of Jesus, um, your life, it, it, you aren't the authoritative person in your life. Jesus is. If, if uh, we kind of view our lives like America in our context, the U.S. government is not our authority. Jesus is. 
Now, now do we follow laws? Of course we follow laws. But, but Jesus is our ultimate authority. That what shapes our whole perspective. It shapes our whole life. It shapes how we want to view this entire world. But this idea of authority is incredible. So can you imagine this um, during this time? So a couple thousand years ago, these, these folks are, are hearing Jesus teach. They're seeing all these miracles, and, and things are just kind of changing all around them. And they're, they're following him. They're listening to what he's doing. He's kind of thousands of people are gathering around anytime he's talking about anything. And he's leaning towards the end of his life, and, and it comes up to this, uh, what we now say is Palm Sunday. And this incredible story begins to happen as, as the last week of Jesus' life is coming up and he's moving towards his death and eventual resurrection. He comes up on the city of Jerusalem. And I want us to see what happens in Luke chapter 19 because I want us to think about the idea of the foundation of what they're built and then this idea of authority. So in Luke chapter 19, verse 36, it says this. As he rode along, the crowd spread out their garments on the road ahead of him. And a different... Transla- or a different passage of telling this story. It talks about the palm branches were laid down as well. So they're putting down palm branches and, and garments ahead of them. When he reached the place where the road started, started down the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. Blessings on the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heavens. Uh, but some of the Pharisees, who were the religious teachers, uh, among the crowd said, Teacher, they're talking to Jesus. Rebuke your followers for saying things like that. And Jesus replies, if they kept quiet, the stones along the road would burst into cheers. But as Jesus came closer to Jerusalem, he, he saw the city ahead, and he began to weep. How I wish that, I wish today that you of all people would understand the way to peace, and that all people he's talking about is those that say that they follow him. But now it's too late, and peace is hidden from your eyes. Before long, your enemies will build ramparts against your walls and encircle you and close in on you from every side. They will crush you into the ground and your children with you. Your enemies will not leave a single stone in place because you did not recognize it when God visited you. So get this. Palm Sunday is pretty fascinating because what they were doing is they're laying down these garments and these branches in front of Jesus as he's coming in. Now here's what's crazy about it. That would have been an unbelievably political statement. Because it would have been an, an, uh, uh, like a, re- a statement of resistance. You see, for a king to come down, this is what would happen. A king would usually come in, and they would have all the armies around him. And uh, in, in this moment, what they would do is they would proclaim uh, uh, where the war that they just won and the land that they just conquered and everything else. And they would come in with all this pomp and circumstance, and the king would be riding on this big white horse, and the people would gather along in the city streets, and, and these guys would proclaim the good news, or what they called the gospel, and they would lay down these branches, and they would throw down their garments as the king came along, and they would think about the authority and the power as they, they passed on by. But here's what's crazy about this. These folks are seeing Jesus come in. And man, they see Jesus coming in, and so they're putting down their palm branches, and they're, they're putting down their, uh, their garments, and here's what they're saying. Rome, you're not our authority. Jesus is. He's the power. He's the, he's the one who's in control of all this. And so they, they lay down these branches and they, they lay down these garments and they, they're shouting, bless is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And they're shouting Hosanna. And they're, and they're like, man, this is our king. But here's the problem. Their foundation had cracks in it. Here's Why? Because these same people that were laying down these palm branches, these same people that are, are laying down their garments, they're neglecting to see that Jesus isn't riding on a white horse. Jesus doesn't have an army around him talking about uh, shouting this gospel, this good news. Jesus is coming in on a donkey, which is a symbol of peace. Modern day equivalent would be like, all right, the, the king or the president or the emperor or whatever of any country comes in that's coming in like a big tank with a big army and they're, they're kind of like, ah, I was like, yeah, right, here's our king, here's our president, whatever it is. And they're talking about the power and authority, but, but the equivalent would be like Jesus coming in on a moped, like zing, zing, you know, like he's coming in. <laughs> and this is how he is, but they missed it. They missed it. They missed the humility of the moment. They missed the truer depth of the moment. Why? Because there was a crack in their foundation. And what was the end result? These same people that were putting down their garments, these same people that were putting down the branches, these same people that were shouting Hosanna and saying, here comes our king. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Just a few day, days later, we're doing this. Crucify him! Crucify him! Crucify him! You see, the crack in their foundation led to the fact that they thought it would be a really good idea to kill an innocent man. 
And I think we've got to wrestle with that. I think we've got to be aware of the areas that we might have some cracks in our foundation. Because when we read a story like that, do you ever put yourself in the situation of saying, you know who I am in that story? I'm the person yelling, crucify him. We don't. We're the ones that put like, I'm putting down the branches. I'd be the one like, when Jesus was up on the cross, I'd be like, you're killing our savior. But would we be? Or would we be the people that would run away when Jesus was on the cross? Would we be the people that were yelling for all that we were worth to crucify him? You know how we know? Look at your foundation. Look what you build your life on. Look what you're really about. You see, if we really want to give authority to Jesus, that means we give it all to him. You see, the areas where we don't give authority to Jesus are the exact areas that we don't actually trust in him, that we don't believe in his truth, that we believe that maybe we, are, we hold more truth than he does. The areas that we're not willing to submit to him are the very same areas that we're like, Jesus, I don't believe you are who you say you are. And so we've got to start looking, what, what are those areas that there might be some cracks? What are those things that the foundation just isn't where it should be? You know, Jesus comes up and he looks at the city and he begins to weep. Now, why does he begin to weep? Because they missed it. They, they missed him. The thing that they were starving for for peace, for purpose, to the thing that they were been longing for to, to build God's kingdom, to experience the thing that they've been hearing about for generations and generations, and they missed it. So Jesus begins to weep because he knows what's coming after that. And here's what I think. I think if Jesus were to come up on Richmond today, he would weep. I think he'd go up to Libby Hill and he'd look over our city and he would say, Guys are missing it. The very thing that could bring you peace, the very thing that could give you the strongest foundation for life circumstances, the very thing that would instill in you the greatest hope and the greatest purpose you could ever imagine, you're missing it because you're looking for the wrong king. You're submitting to the wrong authority. You're trying to build the wrong kind of kingdom. I think if Jesus were to walk into our church, I think he would weep. Not because there aren't any Christians in here, any followers. I think he would come in here and, and I think he would, I think he'd stand up here and I think he'd say, don't miss it. Don't miss it. I get it. You, you might have a doubt about some things. I, I get it. And, and you, you can have doubts, and, and we'll talk about this on Sunday, this next Sunday. I get it, like life's throwing some stuff at you. I get it, it's not like lined up the way you always thought. But don't miss it. Don't build your life on something else that's going to lead to foolish decisions. Don't build your life on anything that's going to take you away from me. Don't build your life on something that's going to make you go... We talked about him being the anchor of peace. I, thought, I think he'd say, do you want to feel peace? Do you want to feel real purpose? Do you want to experience real hope? Then be willing to see me as the final authority in your life. Because here's why. We, we can't follow Jesus and have pers his perspective while giving authority to something else or someone else. So if we truly want and desire the perspective of Jesus and to truly follow him, then we've got to be willing to say, all right, everything's on the table. Everything is on the table. So today, here's what we're going to do. We're going to actually uh, take communion. The band's going to come up right now, and, and we're going um, to sing one more song. I want to take communion together first, though. In, here's what I want us to do. Um, so we're doing communion a little differently today. Um, you guys can get into your, your spots. 
Uh, they'll serve you the bread. You actually have a cup underneath your chair of the juice. All right, so if you don't feel pressure to take communion, don't feel like if you don't want to, you don't have to, no worries. Um, no one's going to judge you. But here's what happens. Um, they're going to deliver uh, the bread to you. Um, I know this matters to some folks, so the bread is gluten-free, um, and it's juice, not wine. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to just hold these elements in your hand. I want you to hold them because I want us to think. I want us to reflect. I want us to process about what we're really building our lives on. Is there something, is there an area in our life where, there's a, where you know there's a crack in the foundation? Is there something, you know, it's just, that's just not right. And I've got to be willing to just let that go and let Jesus be the final authoritative word in that. So you guys can go ahead and hand out the, the bread. Because when we're doing this, you know, the bread represents his body, the, the, blood rep, or the juice represents his blood. And so I want us to take all of this in because when all of that happened and what we celebrate on Good Friday and Easter and everything, that was the established new kingdom, the new hope, the new purpose, the new promise, the new everything for us. So what I want you to do is when you, when you have it, I just want you to just pause. You can close your eyes and um, we're going to do it for about a minute or two um, just with the elements. And um, then I'm just going to lead us through uh, in prayer uh, and then we'll take communion here together. So you guys just close your eyes. And we'll go from here. So God, as we um, hold these elements in our hands, we have the bread which, you know, represents your body being broken for us, but God, it also represents the fact that no matter the storms of life that come, that through you we're able to stand firm. Through you we're able to have a strong foundation. Through you we're able to make it through and be drawn closer to you. So go ahead and eat the bread. And God, this juice represents your blood being shed for us and for the forgiveness of our sin and making things right with you. And it also represents, God, that you are more powerful than sin and evil. That you're victorious over all these things and it truly gives us hope and purpose. And go ahead and drink the juice. So God, we pray that um, that we won't let moments like this go by where we see and feel and know that there might be a little crack in our foundation. We see and feel and know that things aren't where they should be. We see, we feel, we know that um, we find our greatest freedom and hope in you rather than trying to do this on our own. So God, I pray that we will choose to build our life on you. That we will not lose the amazement of your teachings, the awe and wonder of your creation and who you are. And that we will truly see you as the final authority in our life. But we have to choose to accept that. We have to choose to follow that. So God, I pray we will do, all do that today. In your name we pray, everybody said. Will you stand and sing this last song with us?